right before we jump into this video, if you're watching it, you probably own some camera gear. Well, how do you keep it organized and protected? If you don't know, go check out my app called My Gear Vault. You can download it for free right now for iOS as well as Android. Now here's the video. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo. Dot com here at Longwood Gardens, which is about an hour outside of Philadelphia, PA, to do a real-world review of the Nikon D850. So why did I choose to come out to Longwood Gardens with the D850? It's simple. There's a lot of great opportunities for landscape photos, for flower photos, for macro photos, but I also brought out a model so that we could shoot portraits. Those are the things that a lot of people see that this camera can be used for. So to start off the day, we took a walk down one of the flower paths with Tammy Jean. I took some portraits in super harsh sunlight, as well as tested out some of the autofocus capabilities as I had her walk towards me. Now, that wasn't pushing the camera to the extremes. That I will do in another video in the future, but here the focus was on portraits with Tammy Jean. So let's talk about some of the top level specs that you'll find in the D850. It now has a 45.7 megapixel BSI sensor, which is the first time that Nikon has used a BSI sensor. You also find that this camera doesn't have an AA filter, which should lead to sharper images. And being that you have 45.7 megapixels, if you're somebody who likes to crop, you have more cropping ability. Now, because there were no clouds in the sky, I wanted to find some shaded areas to try and get some better photos. So we sat her down on a bench to try to get some photos there. And then we found a really cool gazebo, which had some nice filtered light that was coming through the trees, which made for some nice portraits. What you need to know is that a 45.7 megapixel camera will give you a 100 megabyte RAW file when you shoot 14-bit uncompressed RAW. That's something you need to keep in mind. But if you want to shoot smaller RAW, for whatever reason, I don't know why you would want to do that, you can shoot medium, you can shoot small, and of course, you can shoot all the way up at the highest resolution, large. You're just going to get a larger file. It also gave me the opportunity to look up and capture a cool shot of the gazebo with the fisheye lens. Let's talk about ISO because that's what people care about. You have 64 ISO all the way up to 25,600 natively. There's not a lot of cameras out there that allow you to shoot at 64, which should lead to really fantastic dynamic range in the images that you're capturing. On top of that, Nikon also is claiming that you should get a stop better of ISO, which means better quality images at higher ISOs compared to the Nikon D810. Next up, we kept walking and we came up to the Italian Gardens, which gave me a great opportunity to shoot at 64 ISO to get some really awesome portraits of Tammy. I shot her at 64 ISO with the 70 to 200 2.8 Nikon, and I was cheating the system by having a slower shutter speed than my focal length. Now, what I also did is I switched to the 105 1.4 and tried to cheat the system there, and being that that did not have VR, those images came out with handshakes. So just remember, just because you have 64 ISO doesn't mean you should shoot there if your subject may get a little blurry. So looking at the back of the screen, in basically bright sunlight, I can see everything without a loop. Now I've noticed on some of the Sonys and some of the Canons, it's much more difficult to see the image that you're looking at unless you have a loop. The screens on the back of these high-end Nikons are fantastic. So if you're outside shooting in bright light quite often and you don't carry a loop, this screen 
going to do a good job out there. Right out of the box, you can get seven frames a second, and if you want even more, you can purchase separately the battery grip, which will give you nine frames a second if you have a Nikon D5 battery in there. Now, if you don't have a Nikon D5 battery, this is what it's gonna cost you. $369 for the grip at the time of recording this. It's gonna cost you $179 or so for the battery. And to get the charger, it's gonna be another $369. So you're almost spending $1,000 extra to get those extra two frames a second. I like having the capability of shooting nine frames a second, but I also like having more battery power so I don't have to change batteries as often. And also, when you're shooting vertical, it's much easier to have a button up here when you're trying to get those pictures. Next up, we headed inside to the greenhouse area so that we could bump the ISO up a little bit to get some portraits of Tammy. So because I had a model, I didn't just want to shoot the super tight shots. I tried to get some wider shots with mixed lighting because there were a lot of shadows, which could lead to some interesting edits with a lot of light and a lot of flowers and colors and things like that. If you're a fan of the focusing system in the Nikon D5, then you're gonna be a fan of the D850 because it has 153 autofocus points with 99 of them being cross-type. Now, a lot of you guys see in a lot of other cameras that the focus points are more clumped in the middle. This is nice and wide. Now, it's not as wide as the Sony A9, but it's just as good as the Nikon D5, and I didn't have a problem shooting with it at all. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you're not subscribed just yet, please please hit that subscribe button. If you're watching it on Facebook, please give it a share, like, and comment. Now back to the video. Now inside, I worked with some out of focus foreground elements to try and draw me in to Tammy to get an interesting shot. And some other shots of Tammy sitting there to see what we could do. I think it handled itself pretty well. So this Nikon D850 lets you shoot silent up to six frames a second in raw. So being that we're in this super quiet area and we don't want to distract any of the flowers, why don't I show you how that works? I hit live view, I hit this I button on the back here, and then I go to SL1. That's gonna give me that six frames a second. So now I'm just gonna focus on Tammy. Lock that in, all right, boom, let's press the button. That's right, I just took a picture, you didn't hear it. Now I wanna remind you that this is in no way going to replace a mirrorless camera at any point, anytime soon. Without an electronic viewfinder, it's almost a worthless feature. Now there may be a few circumstances where it comes in handy, but for the most part, you're probably never gonna use this thing. And if you wanna be completely silent, you're gonna get a mirrorless camera because I don't wanna shoot like this ever. I personally love the XQD cards, and one of the things that I noticed when taking rapid fire shots is that the pictures were almost out of the buffer as soon as I took them. So that is the speed of XQD. Unlike the Nikon D5, which has two XQD card slots, this camera has one XQD and one UHS-2 SD card slot. Now, I personally would have preferred to see two XQD card slots because those are super fast. So what you need to do is make sure that if you put in a 128 gigabyte fast XQD card, that you try to put in the fastest SD card that matches it at 128. I love having two cards in the camera at all time, and I always shoot it with reduction redundancy. So I take a picture and it gets saved to both cards at the same time, just in case something ever goes wrong, I have files on both cards. As we moved through the greenhouse, we went to where the bonsai trees were. Now the first thing that I did in there was get some wider shots of Tammy because there was pretty cool shadows that were coming in, so the light looked pretty cool. 
And then after Tammy moved along, I threw on a macro lens, got some nice details of the bonsai trees, as well as those wide shots. So after doing the portraits inside, Tammy had to leave, so we went outside to see her off, and I took some interesting fisheye shots of the amazing grounds behind me. Now, a lot of you guys know that I'm very harsh on using the fisheye lens. What I like to say is use it sparingly, then put it back into the bag and forget about it. It just worked out really well out here because it's such a beautiful grounds. You will find a 3.2 inch tilting touchscreen inside this camera that is 2.3 million pixels. That means when you have a 45 megapixel image that you took, you can zoom in and see something nice and clear because this screen is absolutely beautiful. It's the same one you find on the D500. You will find that you have SnapBridge, you have Bluetooth, you have Wi-Fi, but what you don't have is GPS. One of my recommendations, if you are in a place that has a cell signal, take a picture with your phone, then copy the GPS coordinates later back in Lightroom. So I was trying to look for different images because when you don't have a model to shoot, you wanna to try to see what else you can find. So I thought, wow, there's a lot of shadows. Can I get something cool? I'm not sure, I'll have to see those shots when I get home. You will find a 0.75 magnification viewfinder inside the D850, which is one of the largest, brightest viewfinders that you will find on any Nikon camera. One of the differences that you find between the D810 and the D850 is that they took out the flash. Now by doing so, they created a more weather sealed and dust resistant camera. It also has a magnesium alloy body and it feels great in the hands. This camera is built very well. So the lily pads were really cool, so I tried to get some wider shots, I tried to get some tighter shots, and I think I forgot to get that detailed shot that I really wanted to get of the corner of the lily pad. Now that would have been cool, but there were some flowers there, there were some little bugs flying around, so I think I got some pretty cool shots. So a quick history fact about Longwood Gardens, it was purchased in 1906 by Pierre S. DuPont for $15,500 from the original owners who bought it in the 1700s from William Penn. So much better shooting people, but challenge myself, do some of this, get you guys those sample images. One of the best things about Longwood Gardens is that it is super photographer friendly. We saw so many different photographers out here with their cameras, with their tripods, with their video cameras, doing whatever they wanted within reason without having any worries that anybody would stop them. All the people that work here have been super friendly and super accommodating to us as photographers and to everybody else. So I couldn't recommend it more for you to buy a ticket and come out here to check out Longwood Gardens. And this in no way was a paid plug. We bought our tickets to come out here and shoot. So it seems like Nikon took a lot of things from the D5 and the D500 and included it in the D850, including the joystick on the back, which makes it much easier to move your focusing points. You will also find that you have back illuminated buttons. They move the ISO button to the top, which is in a great place, so you can quickly change your ISO without taking your eye away from the camera. And if you like to shoot tethered, they added a USB 3 connection for faster transfer rates.
So after that, it was time to move on to try and shoot some flower photos, so I threw on the macro lens, and I came upon a bee that was just hanging out on a flower for quite a while, so I just messed around trying to get a really cool macro shot, and I think I got a couple of good ones. If you were hoping for an EVF inside this camera, well, you will be disappointed to find that there isn't one. But if you like to shoot silent, you do have that ability inside of this camera. If you want to shoot even more frames a second in silent mode, you can shoot up to 30 of them in DX mode with 8.6 megapixels, but only getting JPEG. So that's up to you, and you can only get up to three seconds. One of the big things that Nikon was pushing in this camera is that it can do 8K time-lapse. Now, it doesn't do that internally, so what you'll need to do is use an extra software to go ahead and compile those images into an 8K time-lapse video. But if you want to burn it straight in inside of the camera, you can shoot in 4K, then you get that baked time-lapse video. This camera clocks in at just under $3,300, which isn't bad for all of the specs that you're getting. Now let's talk about video. This camera lets you shoot full frame 4K UHD up to 30 frames a second. Now if you want to shoot at 1080, you can go all the way up to 120 frames a second. That's going to give you some super slow-mo, but it's also going to give you a baked in file. The 4K, in my opinion, looks much better and much sharper than what you would find in the Nikon D5. So how does the video look? Well, you're looking at it right now and we're shooting it at 64 ISO. Now if you're wondering, we are shooting it in 4K so that we can get two angles and then in post we put it into a 1080 timeline and then export it to YouTube in 4K. You gotta trust us, it looks much better when you export it in 4K and upload it than if you just put up the 1080 video. We're also recording the audio directly into the D850 and it sounds perfectly fine. Now the reason I bring that up is because in the D500 and the D5, we've never had much luck getting clean audio, so we've always had to use an external audio recording source. Let me jump in here real quick and ask you, do you want to get photos just like I'm getting or shoot videos like the one you're seeing right now? Well, I have four different educational guides that you can check out free previews of right now at fronosphoto.com slash guides. If you've been looking for more professional high-end video features, you will find zebra stripes as well as focus peaking, which focus peaking will come in handy because the autofocus for video in this camera is still pretty terrible. And by terrible, I mean it's really not usable. It just hunts back and forth. It's not as good as Canon. If you're gonna shoot video, dual pixel AF on Canon, that's the way to go. Now I took a bunch of pictures of flowers because, well, they're nice and colorful and they should give you a nice file to play with when you go download it over on the website. Now after that, we moved on to one of my favorite parts of the day, which was walking through the meadows. The meadows were super cool. Landscapes are hard, they're different. For me, I just show up and I take a picture and I'm like, hmm, but I'm gonna stand here for a while or try to frolic in the, through the meadow and try to find some good images. So uh, I think I'm gonna rotate the, I'll try the 14 to 24, but right now I got the 24 to 70 on there trying to see what I can get. And when we were walking through the meadows, we came up on a little pond where there was a blue heron just sitting there. Nature's amazing, and you just sit here and wait for an hour or seven for something to happen. Now I got kind of bored of taking photos of it just sitting there, so we walked away to get some other cool shots.
So how was it shooting with the camera? Now it felt very similar to shooting with a D810, but it didn't feel as good as shooting with a D5. Now let me explain why. My middle finger right here when I hold the camera started to hurt after a while. I don't get that with my D5. I'm not sure if that's something that I just had an issue with or if you would. No, it's not a deal breaker. I just wish it felt a little better in the hands there. Now when I went to change from continuous focus to single focus, I had trouble using my thumb on the side of the camera because it seemed like I just needed to use the edge of the thumb to press the button instead of being able to get a clean push of the button like I do with my D5. So that's something to keep in mind. Now I don't do a lot of landscape photos, but I think I got some cool ones of the trees with the meadow in the background, maybe a, a house up on the hill, but there was something else that was super cool that I'm gonna tell you about in just a second. Now on our way back to the main entrance, we saw that the heron was starting to move and it was stalking something. And what did it do? It attacked. It attacked what looks like a catfish and it speared it with its nose. Then it flew away and I had the wrong exposure and didn't get any good pictures of that, but those photos that I did get were pretty good. As we were leaving the meadow, we came upon the Italian fountains again at a lower angle, and the fountain caught my eye, so I tried to do some tighter shots with the water just popping up in the air to see if I could freeze it, and I think I got a couple of good shots. So I really enjoyed shooting here at Longwood Gardens and the D850 handled very well in my hands and I didn't really see any major problems for the portraits and the landscapes and the macro shots that I was shooting. So the only way to tell how this camera did is to take the files back to the loft and see how they turned out. So let's go back to the loft right now. So here we are back at the loft and I want to remind you that you can download the full res exported JPEGs as well as sample DNG RAW files over at the link on the screen. And one more thing, we are filming this with the Nikon D850. We actually have two of those running right now so we can cut to two different angles. Now let's take a look at the photos. Now this is a tighter headshot. Now yes, it is shot at 500 ISO. Later on, there are sample images shot also at 64. But the point is, I wanna show you how sharp and nice and colorful everything looks. Now this is zoomed in one to one. The 500 ISO looks perfectly fine, but you have to remember that you're using a 45 plus megapixel camera. Each file from the Nikon in 14-bit uncompressed is going to be 100 megabytes. That is a lot of data. And then a lot of people may say, but look, Nikon now gives you the option to do small, medium, large raw with compression. I personally do not want to shoot at any quality lower than what the top quality is. You can always step down. You can't go back up once you take away some of that data. So my recommendation is you always shoot at the highest capable setting that you can. And in this case, it's 14-bit uncompressed RAW, which is going to be 100 megabytes every time you press that shutter. So I'm happy with this photo. Moving on to the next one. Bumped the ISO a little bit to 12,500 because we were in a shaded area. Now we were at Longwood Gardens, as you know from the beginning of the video, but I wanna say that this is just one situation that we tested the camera in. I didn't go into an action sports or a super low light situation, even though coming up I have some higher ISO images. I just wanna reiterate the fact that we went to shoot landscapes and portraits, which, which is a lot of what this camera is gonna be used for. It's also an extremely well-rounded camera. As you know, it could do almost everything, but I'll talk more about that at the end in the wrap-up. Now let's look at it when we zoom in one-to-one. -one. Remember that this isn't a full-on headshot, so you're gonna see a little bit more noise when you zoom all the way in versus the image right before. If I shot this at 12,500, you, would you wouldn't see as much in the way of grain like you do with this one but I, I still like the shot. I like the tones, I like the colors that I'm getting out of it, I like the quality uh, that, that's coming off of that image. Now this one I bumped to 1600 as well, or one step a little higher, because 
She moved on to the other side of the column, which was basically blocking some of the extra light that was coming in from the other side. Uh, you can see extremely sharp, but of course sharp has a lot to do with the lenses you're using, but also having no AA filter will make this nice and sharp when you are looking at these portraits. So moving on, we have this nice vertical portrait. Now I'm at 500 ISO because I needed that extra shutter speed in this shaded area, but I do have one that was shot at 64 coming up in just a second. You already know the importance of having a vertical grip, which I talked about earlier, but the other thing that I want to reiterate here is that the button placement is much nicer compared to the D810. It's very reminiscent, like I said earlier, to the D5. The ISO button's in a cool place so you can quickly get to it and the joystick on the back makes it much easier to move your focusing points around. So moving on to the next, this is where we get into the 64 ISO that people want to see for landscape style photos. So I took this sample image, you can download the raw file over on the site, you can see how far you can bring it back if that's what you want to do. I'll just show you where it started. This is where it started and this is the little quick edit that I ended up doing, but you can pixel peep this one all yourself when you take it into the computer. Now here is where we get into the 64 ISO of the portraits with the 70 to 200 like I was saying earlier. Now look, I'm at 100 ISO. I said this in the video. You have to be super careful and super stable. Make sure you have IS in order to compensate for this because I'm at 165 on the millimeters. So I'm breaking all the general rules of thumb here, but I was still able to get it nice and tack sharp. At 64, it is super clean. There are so few cameras, if any, out there other than the DA10 that lets you shoot at 64 ISO to get super clean, colorful, sharp, crisp shots. I'm really happy with the way that this image looks. I'm happy with how clean this file is. And let's move on to the next thing. Now we went indoors and I still only went to 100 ISO because I wanted to try and keep it as low as possible for everybody out there to see that type of quality. Now this one, I like in black and white more than color, but I want to show you the color because you can see I used an out of focus flower in the foreground. There's some out of focus stuff in the background. And just so that we could draw you in to the subject right here and see how super tack sharp, colorful, and really all around the files are looking pretty nice off of this camera. Now we moved further into the Arboretum and we sat her down on a bench to get this shot. Again, the quality, the colors, the, the, the tones, what I'm able to bring out of the file, I'm very happy with. Do you want to show the world that you shoot raw? Well, if you want to pick up anything I shoot raw related, head on over to store.fronosphoto.com to pick up some swag. So outside you have these amazing fountains. This is where a fisheye came in handy to take this shot. To basically be able to show the entire fountain area is not very easy. But this is from one image. This isn't a stacked image and it's at 64 ISO. And I was able to get some nice color and nice tones and bring back the shadow areas right where I wanted them. Look, this is what the image, image started at, and this is where the edit went. Yes, it does have more of an HDR effect to it, but a lot of people like this type of quality or like this type of look when they shoot their landscape photos. Again, go download this raw file, see how you like the file for yourself, then you can make a determination on whether or not it's good or bad. So moving on, saw awesome shadows, Took a couple pictures of the shadows to see how they would look. They look fine in black and white to me. Moving on, I broke out the 105 macro because it was in my bag. Now it was in my bag because we were gonna shoot flowers, which means there may be bees and bugs around uh, to try to get some cool macro shots with. Now, I don't generally do a lot of landscape style photos, but because it's the D850 and it shoots at 64, and this is what a lot of people want from this camera. They want nature, they want landscapes, because with 45 megapixels, you have some extreme croppability options for those nature photos if that's what you're looking for. But let's look at this macro shot. We had this bee just hanging out on this flower, and I was like, okay, bee, I'm gonna take photos of you. It's focused on his upper eyes. Not that those are eyes, I don't know if they're eyes, but this is at 2000 ISO. The next one is at 6400 ISO. Why am I at 6400? Because I went to F11 to try and get a little bit more in focus. This is where that focus stacking option may come in handy if you have a subject like a bee that's, that's dead 
and not going to be moving so that you can try those 300 stacking photos to get an extreme macro shot. I just bumped it to f11 to try to get as much as I could in camera because I couldn't use the stacking outside because the flowers are moving, the bug will move, so it wasn't the best opportunity to use that, but I did the best with what I had, and I think I'm really happy with the quality of this. Look, look at this. If I needed to crop in more, I could crop in more. That's personal preference. I don't personally like doing that but some of you guys may but I'm still happy with the color of this at 6400 ISO as well as the clarity because of that no AA filter moving on cool flower shots just wanted to show some cool colors uh, these flowers were super awesome it became overcast at the time that we were shooting this so that's why there's not a lot of light in the background there um, then they had a meadow now, if you ever go to Longwood Gardens, I highly recommend you spend a couple hours walking through the meadows, uh, but this is at 64 ISO. Just to show you a landscape photo, what will you do with the sky? How do the colors look? Is the clarity where you want it to be? Again, that's for you guys to determine. I'm happy with the results that I got with this camera so far. I mean, 6400 ISO, you can't beat how clean a file is there. Just remember though, yes, 64 is great, but you still need to be able to get the image and get the proper exposure. And that means if you're getting a subject that's running or moving, you still need to compensate and have a fast enough shutter speed. Look at this, I'm at, I'm at 1 500th of a second. I did shoot at 2.8. I didn't want to have everything extremely in focus, so that's why I focused on the tree at f2.8. Then we had a blue heron that was in the water, and we went over there, and this thing literally sat here for a good... Uh, I would have to venture to say over two hours in this same position. We didn't wait there for two hours, but thought I would get a shot. Nature photographers always want to know, how is this camera for nature? And I'll show you that in a second when we get back to those blue heron photos. Um, just thought that this was a cool type of image. I saw the flower uh, just sticking up above the rest of the meadows. This is probably over six feet tall, and I wanted to shoot it with the house out of focus in the background. Just, in my opinion, a cool little nature shot. Now, the blue heron finally moved. It was stalking something. I went to 6400 ISO because he went into the shadows, where obviously it's much darker. And I stayed at 1 1,000th of a second because what if something happens and the bird decides to turn and fly away? I still need to be able to freeze the motion. That's why I bumped it up higher. Now let's zoom in and see how it looks. Even at one-to-one, -one, yes, you see this noise and this grain in the background. That's not a big deal because we're at one-to-one. -one. If you printed this 20 by 30, you wouldn't see any issues at all. But nice color, nice tones, nice sharpness. Again, using the 70 to 200, which was the longest lens that I brought. Moving on, you can see that he stalked something and he captured it. This is where I took, I tried to take five, six frames in a row to see what I would get. To be honest with you, I didn't know what he was doing, or she, I don't know if it's a male or a female. I literally focused where I needed to focus in continuous focus. And as soon as the thing made a move, boom, 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 boom. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't even know it came up with this. It got a fish, but the next shot's even better. You can see right here that he speared the fish. He speared the fish and he's gonna go take it away and eat it. Now, again, 6400 ISO, one 1,000th one of a second. He did turn around and fly away and I failed. One, I didn't hit focus and two, my exposure was totally wrong because it was so much darker underneath the trees as it was into the overcast sky or with this background where he was flying into. Uh, it wouldn't have been the best shot because he was flying away from me, but I'm just showing you that what was going through my mind was if this bird turns and flies, I need to have the right shutter speed. I would have been able to bring it back with the raw file that still doesn't make it right that my exposure was wrong. It just happened super fast and I wanted to make sure that I got a shot like this and I'm really happy with the quality that I was able to pull out of this one, right? Look at that. That fish is saying, I don't know what he's saying, he's probably not happy. And moving on to the last one right here, uh, we were walking back to the entrance to leave and the fountains were going and I'm like, oh, I wanna see what I can get in terms of freezing this water. 1 2500th of a second, 200 ISO. Um, and I just liked freezing the water droplets. There's a bunch of samples from this real world review, but there's two major questions that need to be answered. Who is this camera for? And is it a worthy upgrade from the Nikon D810? 
Now this is Nikon's jack of all cameras. You can shoot just about anything with this. Now of course with any camera you can probably shoot just about anything. It's you knowing what you're doing with it. But this camera goes up against something like a Canon 5D Mark IV and at least spec wise comes out on top in a lot of different situations. If you shoot weddings, if you shoot portraits, if you shoot nature, then this is a very worthy camera for you to look at. And even on top of that, low light situations like concerts, as well as things that are fast action, like sports or anything where things are moving fast, it's gonna do a great job. The autofocus, I didn't get to push it terribly too far with what I was shooting, but it has the same focusing system as the Nikon D5, which means it is super good because I have a lot of experience using that one. And in low light situations, even with 6400 ISO, that looked perfectly fine. It's not going to be as good as the Nikon D5 because there's more megapixels. Now I didn't get to push the ISO terribly too far, but 6400 looked really good for those nature photos that I was capturing. Now compared to the D5, you're not going to get the same high SO capability, but it's a trade-off. You're getting a ton of megapixels in exchange for not having as good of a high ISO capability as possible. Now in the future, I plan on shooting this in super low situations like a concert to see how it actually does turn out. And I will post those files for you guys to look at in the future. But from my experience using the camera, it did a fantastic job in capturing what I needed it to capture. That's what you're looking for in a camera. And yes, it comes comes at a price. So if you can't afford it, obviously it's not something you're going to pick up. But if you can afford it, yes, it's a well-rounded camera that's going to allow you to shoot almost anything you could ever think of. Now for those who own a Nikon D810, you have to ask yourself, is it worth the upgrade? The first thing I like to ask is, do you make money with the camera? Can you afford it? Those are the basic simple things. If you can afford it, then of course, buy whatever it is that you want to use. But you have to ask yourself, do you need more megapixels? Do you want slightly better ISO? Do you need to shoot video? Do you want to shoot 4K video? Well, then this camera would be a worthy upgrade if you're looking to shoot 4K video. If you're looking for better autofocus in terms of video, no, it's not going to give you that, so that isn't something worthy of an upgrade. But if you need more frames per second, if you need focus stacking, if you need the 8K time lapse, then yes, this is a worthy upgrade. You just have to sell your old body, get some money, and put it up into this new body if that's what you need to do. But yes, I think it is a worthy upgrade if you're a professional who's making money or can afford it. If you're somebody out there shooting, you're not going to get very much different with the D850 than the D810 in terms of the images that you're already capturing to make it worthy of an upgrade. You have to determine that yourself. If you make money doing this and the camera will make you money and be able to pay it off, then yes, it's a worthy upgrade. But if you're just somebody who likes to go out and shoot, it's not going to get you that much better quality in the long term than sticking with your Nikon D810. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's one situation where we use this Nikon D850. I'm very happy with the camera, and for transparency purposes, I purchased a Nikon D850 for us to use at the factory, for me to have as a backup body when I need more megapixels. And really, that's about it, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Please be sure to subscribe, leave some comments down below, and that's where I'll leave it. Jared Polin, froknowsphoto.com. See ya.